thank you, Congressman, again, for taking the time. Just to provide a little background, as a 17-year small business owner, Congressman is, was first elected to the House of Representatives in 92 and is currently serving his 15th term. He is one of the most senior members of Congress and currently sits on the House Appropriations Committee, where he's ranking member of the Defense Subcommittee, as well as sitting on the House uh, Energy and Water Subcommittee. Thank you, Congressman, for taking the time. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, as a senior appropriator, I've been busy working on all the appropriation bills uh, that, uh, that are before us. We passed all 12 appropriation bills last week. Um, and uh, so that's the good news, uh, including the bill that I'm the uh, ranking Republican on, the defense appropriation bill, which is about half the discretionary budget. That, that doesn't include uh, mandatory funds. That, that's uh, is, uh, handled separately. Uh, we have a bipartisan uh, number of senators um, that are working on an infrastructure proposal. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Uh, Senator Schumer has asked for a cloture vote this Wednesday, kind of murky about how the pay for is, how they're going to pay for this a trillion dollar infrastructure bill. Um, so we'll see, uh, we'll see where that, uh, where that, where that goes. Uh, one thing that uh, also that the majority is working on is, on top of that trillion dollars is a $3.5 trillion uh, package of so-called human infrastructure and other uh, spending proposals uh, that they're proposing. Uh, and if you take the, the appropriations process on the discretionary side, which is about one and a half trillion, the non-discretionary side, which is about 1.6, 1.7 trillion, then you take the $1 trillion infrastructure bill and you put it on top of the $3.5 trillion appropriation bill that they're talking about. Obviously, we start getting very concerned about inflationary pressures, which we're already uh, experiencing. Uh, I think it's like pouring fuel on a fire. Uh, these, by the way, these agencies in the government are just awash in money. Just from the previous COVID bills, a lot of that money wasn't associated to COVID. It went to other purposes. And so uh, I'm very concerned about inflation. Uh, I, I know that your industry is concerned about inflation. Uh, and so uh, I think that we as a nation uh, needs to need to realize that uh, some of the spending is not a good idea. A lot of it's not a good idea. And uh, hopefully, if we're going to spend money, we can pay for it as much as possible, not just continue to print money uh, like we're doing. Uh, you know, I was proud of the tax cuts we did in the previous administration. And of course, to pay for all this, uh, they're, they're, at least they're going to try to pay for some of it, I guess, because you just can't print it all, is that they're going to uh, try to take away all those tax cuts, including, including the death tax, including, uh, you know, cap want to raise capital gains significantly, uh, the uh, regular income tax, so forth and so on, even getting rid of uh, tax, to, you know, tax uh, uh, provisions that we've had in the code for many years, like uh, exchanges, things like that, which are very important to, to business people such as yourself. And I know there are policy concerns, uh, including corporate uh, tax hikes. And also we, you know, they're talking about different kind of recall mandates. We can discuss that further if you like. Uh, and uh, and a, a new number of regulations that will be spread across the, the economy. So a lot of concerns um, and, uh, and I certainly share those concerns and uh, hopefully we can get the country uh, back on track now that this pandemic is ending uh, and use some common sense while we're doing it. So with that, I'll you try to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, thanks Congressman for the rundown. Um, yeah, going back to what you quickly touched on, um, Regarding recalls, uh, we've been heavily engaging with the House and Senate on recall legislation. Uh, thankfully, it wasn't included in the House Invest Act. Uh, on the Senate side, it was filed during committee uh, committee markup on, in Senate Commerce. Um, we're hearing that it's going to be we're in a good spot when um, the larger infrastructure package, uh, to your point, goes to the floor uh, this Wednesday. Hopefully, maybe. Um, you never know at this point, but um, so hopefully we're, we're in a good spot there. Um, 
And then, you know, another big issue you touched on is uh, the whole corporate tax rate uh, increase from 21 to 28%. Um, that's a, a big concern to our members just because a lot of our, our members are S Corps and LLCs. So when you tie in um, the personal incomes to their businesses, the, the 7% increase is very detrimental to our members. Since the House passed all 12 approach bills, September 30th is coming down in the pipeline. This larger infrastructure package is coming. Are you, uh, how do you see us all playing out within you know, a month and a half? August recess is coming up as well. How do you see this all playing out before the 30th and the rest of the year? Well, as far as the appropriation bills are concerned, as I mentioned, all 12 bills passed out of committee. They're hoping that the majority wants to bring up uh, half of those appropriation bills next week uh, to the floor and pass that out in a what they call a, a mini bus, or it's probably, a, I'll, I'll call it half a bus. It's about half the, <laughs> the appropriation bills. It will not include uh, my bill, defense appropriations. It will not include foreign ops. It will not include Homeland Security, it will not include Commerce State Justice, which is the more uh, controversial bills. And the problem is they don't have enough money in the bill. They've raised uh, non-defense discretionary spending by 12.5% across the board, but cut defense in effect by it's not even able to keep up with inflation. While the uh, national defense strategy says that we need to keep this uh, defense budget at about a 3 to 5% net increase per year just to have some level of parity with our near peer rivals such as China and Russia. So every agency, which I said earlier, is just a wash in money. They don't know what the hell to do with it. And then now they want to put more money in them. So we'll see. As far as we're going to be on time, I, I suspect they'll get this uh, half bus out. They'll send that over to the Senate. And the Senate will deal with it. They'll probably use that as a vehicle to put together an appropriation bill. What they're going to have to do is lower non-defense, uh, uh, or, or non-defense discretionary spending. They're going to have to put the hide language back in, which is the the pro-life language that has been in the bill forever. That means that taxpayers don't pay for uh, abortions. And to uh, bring up the defense spending, like I said, to, to at least a three percent level, the Chinese are uh, uh, already far exceed us in number of ships, num uh, and uh, that should be a concern to all of us. Uh, they're already knocking on Taiwan's door, so uh, this is uh, not good for the for the country, I think. And so uh, we'll see. But hopefully, though, we can make a deal with the Senate get the bill back and then uh, we'll see if we can pass it and hopefully before September uh, 30th. Thank you, Congressman. Um, going back again to, to this larger infrastructure package, um, you know, there has been in Biden's original proposal and, and um, Senator Schumer and others have been pushing this whole EV electric vehicle um, push, right? And within Biden's proposal, there was uh, electric vehicle pay, um, stipends for those wanting to switch in combustion engines to EVs uh, and this whole large uh, push for government vehicles going fully electric uh, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, how do you see that again playing out um, in a larger infrastructure package uh, if you have any insight on that? Well, obviously, uh... Climate change is something that is a big deal uh, with the majority. Uh, they are trying to put language mandates the, the development of electric vehicles as much as possible, and obviously the means to uh, to recharge those vehicles. And putting that in the uh, in the one of the two infrastructure bills, I don't know which one it will be in. Quite frankly, we don't have the details of the uh, the infrastructure bill, which was supposedly going to be paid for which is something that most people could support if they really have real pay for it. I mean, in other words, uh, how do we, you know, so it's gonna be, and that's being kept under wraps. But, uh, but there's no secret that the, uh, the Democratic Party is pushing the development of electric vehicles and uh, they want to, to rapidly change out the fleet of cars in the United States uh, to, to all electric if they can do it. But there's still, as you know, a lot of challenges to, to, do, uh, to do that. And uh, but their schedule is to do that 
you know, sooner than later. I keep hearing different years in which they want to see where no more, uh, you know, traditional vehicles are being made. So, we'll, we'll, you know, that they're mandating that in the economy, which I don't think is a good idea. The, the best way to do that is let the, the economy and the customers determine which cars they want. And the traditional automobiles have gotten cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And there is a cost to electricity. You still have to have power plants. You still have to make the batteries and so forth and so on. You have to be able to dispose of those batteries. There's no such thing as a free lunch. So I think we ought to be careful about how fast we're moving these technologies. That's a great uh, segue into, you know, in addition to the infrastructure not really there to handle going fully electric, um, you know, the real question is, is all, you know, not every electric vehicle is affordable to low middle class families. Um, and then also the infrastructure packet infrastructure isn't there. And you see those long lines at Tesla supercharged stations as you're traveling up and down 95 or, um, you know, in, uh, on the West Coast. So it's, it's definitely concerning to our members, especially as the used car market is, is insane right now. Um, and the, you know, the inventory isn't there and prices are, are soaring. So, you know, if there's a big push to going fully electric, it will extremely hurt our, our membership. Well, I agree with you. I think that it's the timing of it. Let the economy determine how quickly we're going to go on this and, and let the consumers make up their mind. As, as electric vehicles become more um, acceptable to the consumer, it'll, it'll naturally increase sales and people you know, have to be comfortable that they can re re electrify that car when they choose to at a rapid rate where they can use it for, you know, for everyday purposes, especially in areas like California, where we commute long distances and, you know, we want certainty. And, and as far as being able to charge the vehicle and being able to get to point A to point B. Uh, but, you know, when it, we, you know, the other side of the aisle is getting more and more into a command economy and they want to determine uh, what kind of vehicles are going to be made, when and where and how. And uh, that's not a good idea. And I think in a capitalist economy where we ought to le leave it to the consumer, uh, I think for the most part, to make that determination. I just want to um, touch on another uh, issue on the regulatory side. Uh, an agency that has concerns for our members um, that are buy here, pay here are, is a consumer uh, CFPB, the Consumer Federal Protection Bureau. Um, we, we've heard that with Rohit Chopra being, um, nominated, there was, and, uh, a, a split vote in, uh, in the Senate Commerce Committee, um, the, the White House was waiting until Lena Khan was going to get confirmed at the FTC to then, um, circle back on Chopra's confirmation. Can you tell us anything that you're hearing on that aspect? You know, if not, we just hope that, uh, any Anybody on your staff can just keep us informed of what they're hearing. Well, we'll, we'll try to keep you informed. I, I do know that that's not one of, uh, from our perspective, the Republican perspective, one of our favorite agencies. And, um, you know, which, again, we're regulating access to credits is, is, uh, is a slippery slope. I mean, who, who do you regulate? How do you regulate? Uh, how does that slow down the access to capital? Uh, and especially in a struggling, you know, as, as we come out of this pandemic, uh, that uh, people can't uh, finance, uh, you know, their vehicle purchases. Uh, you know, government generally doesn't help uh, as far as making things uh, easier for for businesses. So, uh, unfortunately, I think uh, with you know with this president in the White House, uh, the CFPB will likely be empowered to pursue even more aggressive regulations. And uh, I don't think. That's going to be healthy to your industry or any other industry, quite frankly. So we'll see. This is from John, who is our, our executive director in California. His question was, how can the auto dealers in, district, in your district best support you? And what can we tell them is the best way that you can support them? Well, I know, you know, most of the dealers out in, in my area, they're, they're all good friends. And, and, and as you know, like dealers across the country involved in their communities, an important part of our of our economy and um, just continue to call me if they have any concerns, let me know what they usually do. I, as you know, car dealers are not not shy about giving their opinions. I, I know them all very well. And, uh, but continue to do that. I mean, I, I enjoy listening to them. 
and uh, try to help as much as I can. Thank you, Congressman. I'm not too sure if I had, if I had brought this up with your staff, but there is a bill coming out of the House Finance Committee under, under water is the Fair Debt Collection Act. We're hearing a DOA on, in the Senate, but just wanted to flag it for your, for your staff um, to keep an eye on it. They got to collect the debts. I mean, you know, right now, and this is, I mean, people don't want to be able to collect rent. You can't collect on your people that owe you money. I mean, goodness gracious, you know, you're not going to have an economy if you can't do that. And then one more from uh, another member of ours. Recently, we've seen attacks on companies through the internet. Is Congress aware of the, uh, in the event of an attack on an electric grid, the American people will be unable to mobilize if, if the need arises? Are you aware of any of that? Well, every day our adversaries uh, are trying to find ways in order to um, attack, attack us and to find out what vulnerabilities we have whether it's in the internet or whether it's anywhere within our, you know, within our economy, but they get access to the internet. So we depend on, for instance, the national surveillance agencies, other agencies to help put the barriers in to keep those um, bad actors from uh, hacking into, into anything. And, uh, but it happens every day. I mean, we, we, uh, we have, you know, a cyber command that's uh, headed up by General Nokasoni, uh, 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 who uh, is doing everything he can to make sure that we defend this country. But at some point, uh, I think, for instance, when we saw the attack recently on the, on the pipeline and when we've seen the Sony, at Sony attack a number of years ago, that we're going to have to uh, use offensive capability that we have to teach these folks a lesson. I think we're getting very close to that. If, in fact, uh, President Biden wants to use the capability we do have, which is considerable, by the way. With all the other states jumping on the bandwagon for electric vehicles, is it worth this partnering on money's back, new and used? And is it worth the cash back from the state and lost gas tax income at the pump for roads? You're right. And the, it's going to be challenges as, you know, let's say, I think, the inevitability of the electric automobiles growing is, is a reality. I, I see, I, from what I read, and you guys would know more about that than I do, but it seems from what I'm reading that uh, the automobile dealers are looking, or manufacturers are looking down the road and they see the overall acceptance of electric vehicles and more and more of them, because a percentage of their output is going to be electric vehicles. And you're right about how, how do we pay for the uh, infrastructure that uh, roads and highways, which have been traditionally paid for by gasoline taxes. So we're going to have to look at ways in order to, uh, different ways in order to pay for that. So that's, um, whether it's use fees or, um, or registration fees at, at the time in which you, you, you register your car, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to look at that, but that's going to be a big challenge. And then one last question in regards to 2022, uh, how do you see things turning out? Um, you know, slim margins in the House, tied up in the Senate. Um, how do you, think, how do you see, see things playing out then in that aspect? I think we're gonna, uh, historically, uh, the House, the party that's out of power when the party that's in power holds both the House and the Senate and the presidency, traditionally pick up anywhere from 24 to 36 seats. And I, I uh, and that which of course would bring us back the majority in the house. Uh, and I certainly agree with that. I, I think that we may even exceed that, that number based upon, you know, what I see around the country, I'm involved in helping that process along. And I see a lot of people that are in, very enthusiastic about changing uh, the, the bringing the Republicans back in control of the House and in the United States Senate. It's a little more challenging in the Senate because of the math, uh, but the uh, but I, I believe that we can uh, we can do that too. So I'm very optimistic. Again, Congressman, thank you for taking the time. We appreciate it. We appreciate you um, giving us the rundown of what's really happening in D.C. rather than what we're hearing on the news. And so again, I appreciate your time and thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Brett and. Uh, Look forward to seeing all my friends in the automobile business back home soon, I hope.
Thank you, Brett, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have any other questions, please contact NIADA's Brett Scott.